All right, so one, where to start? I guess with this long-winded intro. For the past couple of months, my friends have been begging me to watch this unique and dark object show called One, and it was horrific, realistic, and depressing compared to other object shows. Instead of random things happening with little to no explanation like in object shows like Battle for Dream Island or Inanimate Insanity, here, we are shown the repercussions of what would happen if completely normal people were forced to interact with something as mentally insane as an average object show which they have never heard of. Now sure, other contestants without too many human qualities to their mental get added and adapt decently to their climate. But as for the humanoid objects, they go through many hardships whether physically or mentally. They can hurt. They can feel. They can die. Now that's something you can't really say for most object shows now, can ya? The more the show goes on, the more these characters begin to develop mental issues, eventually learning to cope with living in a really abstract and lifeless world, possibly never being able to return to their normal lives ever again. They begin to learn about one another as they show off survivor-like mentalities. The first season is focused on the competition and the various traumatic moments the characters continuously endure as they try to put logic into intentionally weird and illogical situations. The second, however, focuses on Liam and Bryce trying to uncover the mysteries of the show with the help of various clues hidden in the first season, through means of persuasion, bonding, dimension hopping, world ending discoveries, the sorts. So following the light of the finale of one, I decided to binge for the entire series in a matter of two and a half hours, with the help of my CD player playing Radiohead's Hail to the Thief, of course. And for the first time in a long while, I felt I might have had something to discuss following the binging of a short series. For shows like BFB, despite how much of a fitting conclusion it is to the decade-long legacy of the show, I surprisingly didn't have much to say, remember, or express besides fan art. One is something definitely worth remembering for sure. Today, we're about to go over why for my various scatterbrained thoughts. First, we shall start things off with the major elephants in the room, and that's the show's presentation. The whole series, in terms of its genre, feels dull, but artistically poetic. Whilst the show mostly presents its animation in a stiff, but mostly human-like capacity, the other details beyond that are something to point out. The episode's thumbnails, pre-post-credit sequences, and important moments have this very unique art style, with various black and white patterns surrounding the characters. When the eyes are visible in these sequences, that's when you know damn well the characters shown are meant to be important, or if they just had some sort of realization or moral epiphany. Whether its usage is long or short, there's a reason for each moment to occur. Another thing I'd like to point out is the show's sequencing. Sometimes, other object shows like to have each season take place in order, with only occasional different timelines depending on the show. Here, multiple scattershot flashbacks take place, leaving the viewer to try to piece things together, such as exactly what the characters were doing before they suddenly appear in the plane, as it's called. <laughs> yeah, just like that! Anyways, I tell her they're near the back, and she just, I can't- Do not look at me with the dumbest look you could possibly- <laughs> Uh, 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 where am I? Oh, of course, now you're apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Give me my money back. I'm sorry. Do you seriously think I'm gonna forgive you? I hope you rot in a dumpster, you filthy piece of garbage. What the- uh Thanks to its puzzle piece-like presentation, this knowledge will help to further piece together future moments within the show, such as the elimination tactics, the meaning behind the plug, important character moments, the such. Though, it's not too distracting to where the show's timeline still flows normally throughout the two seasons. One of my favorite examples of HFJ's skills to create a decent puzzle-solving experience for the viewers is the season one finale, Scatterbrain. Now, as some of you may know, I'm a pretty huge fan of Radiohead, and the fact that such an artistically important and rebellious alt-rock band like Radiohead got recognition on an artistically important and rebellious object show like One is surprisingly fitting and poetic. Both Radiohead and One are consistently categorized, and they're pretty much sick and tired of that, especially with the climate surrounding their categorization, like Radiohead's distaste for bands like Oasis, Today is gonna be the day that you're going home back to you. And one's distaste for the monotony of the relentless cycle of other object shows. What's up, it's your boy? We're gonna smash this thing. Yeah, let's do it. Would you like a sledgehammer? Is it delicious, tasty, free? I'm not quite sure I understand. 
but I'm getting too ahead of myself, let's get back to Scatterbrain. While the entirety of the episode itself is mostly silent, with the episode consisting of ambient noises, if you see this timer on the top left corner of the screen with a pretty subtle usage of a metronome to indicate some form of timing, and if you play Scatterbrain right when the play button shows, whether it be on another YouTube tab or my CD player because I'm a true Radiohead dick rider, not only does the beat sync up with the cutting between scenes, but the content of the lyrics match up perfectly and subtly with the content of the episode itself. the episode's description literally says the song's official alternate title as Dead as Leaves, which is metaphorically important for both the show and the album from which it came from. And spoilers for the series finale, but another good usage of music is with Pearl Jam's Around the Bend, the song that plays in the finale, and it's a song that plays on the cassette player. Like with Scatterbrain, Around the Bend can make sense in the context of one itself. The phrase Around the Bend commonly means to be mentally confused, just like the title of Scatterbrain. So it makes sense within the context of Aerie's antisocial personality and Liam's purpose in living in the forest world for the rest of his natural born life. To me, the music that describes an object show probably determines its quality. For BFDI, the show's soundtrack is just stock tracks from Kevin McLeod, I probably butchered that, giving it an unintentionally randomized goofy vibe. For my friend's show, The Fight for the Magical Wish, the show's soundtrack consists of stock jazz pieces, giving it a chill, almost Tribe Called Quest kind of vibe. For one, this show's soundtrack is composed entirely by Cheesy HFJ, and its instrumental sounds something similar to something like Mario Paint. Most of the compositions sound like a twisted, dark version of the Kevin stock tracks from BFDI. The most important usage of the show's presentation, in my personal opinion, is how much stuff it subtly borrows from other object shows. Sure, there's still a contest with multiple competitions, a prize, and an elimination system, but the contests themselves are also purposefully derivative of other object show openers like BFDI or Inanimate Insanity. The comedy, while exceedingly rare, does work at times when it needs to, such as character reactions and the usage of object disappearances. Hey look, Talking Heads and Radiohead, how poetic! Other similarities to point out are the world building, which we will touch upon later, and the fact that the show ends on the cliffhanger, like the running joke within the community that it'll possibly stay that way for the next couple of years, or even decades. I'm surprised that HFJ actually got death threats for this ending and had to delete his Twitter account for this. Yet when shows like BFDI and Clone High were either cancelled or on hiatus, none of the staff for any of those shows got any backlash. It's all a vicious cycle. Also to those who would try to make a case for some kind of Clone High backlash, that backlash was only warranted with the portrayal of Gandhi, who is now rumored to be renamed as Gary Coleman in Season 2. Next we shall move on to the writing of the characters and the environment around them. As stated before, a decent amount of characters are given lots of levels of humanity to their writing, and while they may not be the most fleshed out of characters, they have levels of relatability to where you want to see these helpless individuals just desperately get back to their normal lives. And sadly, in the case of the finale, while it is true for most contestants, the same can't be said for others. I also love how other characters are given actual names to correspond with their placement in the society of the alternate universe they live in. For example, for the main characters at least, we have Liam, a calm and relaxed employee who works at an office in San Francisco, California. <laughs> He's also one of the most important characters of the bunch. Next we have Bryce, who's rather apathetic and previously worked at a fast food chain in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Amelia's up next. She's a calm, down-to-earth, but oftentimes emotional yoga instructor who used to live in Yakima, Washington. Charlotte is an independent, but oftentimes self-destructive grouch who is formerly a cave explorer in Brunswick, Georgia. Taylor is a social optimist, attending some form of a high school at Toledo, Ohio. And Charlie is an 11-month-old infant being taken care of by his mother Alice in Greensburg, Indiana. What all of these characters have in common are the effects almost all of them seem to share after being transported to the plane. 
Sure, there are other important characters such as Texty, the search engine in Bradley's computer, but it's mostly these characters and their negative mental health effects that are the main focus of the show. Liam develops some sort of social anxiety and is presumed dead to the world. Bryce gains a newfound appreciation for life, but is still angered by the actions of Aerie and teams up with Liam to stop him. Amelia loses all hope in any form of a chance to escape and becomes less and less motivated to teach yoga. And Charlotte, at first, is adamant on winning the competition for her mold treatment, until later in the show when she begins experiencing signs of existential doubt and worry. As stated before, when Bryce and Liam are eliminated, they both decide to team up to figure out the mystery of one and put a stop to Aerie's plan. Through their team up in Season 2, we get introduced to more of the world and what lies beyond, such as the backstory of the contest, how we're introduced to characters such as Owen, and of course, the waiting room which can either be used as both a way to enter the true afterlife, or as a way to dimension hop for the usage of the Universal Modulation Radio, which is what Aerie used to enter the forest world and set up what would eventually become One. Oh yeah, speaking of Aerie, he comes across as a socially awkward loner who lacks in self-awareness, especially not being aware of the trauma he inflicted onto his fellow contestants, and as a well-meaning host that means no harm despite what many of the show's clues may lead others into believing. Okay. Especially when he gives the detail that he'd learn how to teleport people and calm them down by distracting them with a game show. Anyways, back to the waiting room. Through Stone's cryptic messages, we eventually learn how the radio can be used and how exactly Stone knows of all of these locations in various dimensions. He does state in sign language that he knows everything that has, is, and will happen in the universe, so yeah. Through the dimension hopping, we see lots of the show's attempts at showing off its comedy and world building. But since it isn't meant to do so, it doesn't linger on for too long. As stated with the show's presentation, lots of character moments can be very scattershot. So most of the character moments aren't exactly clear on the first viewing, but they become more and more clear the more you dig into them. Through the show's writing and development, I surprisingly draw lots of comparisons to somewhat similar shows like Stranger Things. But hey, I'm an uncultured nerd boy that spends too much time listening to uncool musical artists like Eminem or Arctic Monkeys instead of trying to focus on the importance of peak fiction, so who's really the judge here? One problem I have with the writing, however, are the rest of the 12 contestants who aren't really given much to go off of other than the fact that they're all secretive objects or things that previously belonged to someone or something, and they're simply used to drive the plot forward. Because of what they're used to, they aren't given enough screen time to flesh out, but at least they're proof of the show's ever-expanding world-building. In summary, put two and two together, what do you get? The show's execution. Oh boy, buckle in because we're about to get into some real spoiler territories here. For this section, I'll go over the main highlights of one and its gradual lore, while I also share my favorite aspects of the story. With a special guest appearance by my best friend Grimster, so stay tuned for that. The show starts out like just another object show with a bit of a depressingly realistic twist. During the contest, we see incidents regarding child death, traumatic near-death experiences, and multiple mysteries that are alluded to within the season. More and more contestants get added and the show progressively becomes weirder and weirder. To the original six, this is absolute chaos, but to Aerie, it's going just as planned. Now, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. That is, except for in regards to Stone, who has some pretty spooky mysteries to display. They're surprise tools that can help us later. I also completely forgot to mention the relationships and interactions the characters build with each other. Since they're stuck for god knows how long on the plane, they naturally start opening up about themselves like names and locations. Though some may be a bit more pushy than others, there's ultimately little to no bad blood between anyone. It's like being trapped in a ski lift or an elevator for god knows how long. Like, what's to do but to bond with the others, eh? Bryce and Liam both share a mutual respect towards one another, especially during Season 2. Liam and Amelia's relationship is also very positive, with Amelia opting to get Liam eliminated so he wouldn't have to suffer anymore. How selfless of her. They then share a wholesome talk. Suddenly, Aerie is presumably knocked out, and Liam suffers some form of crisis, thinking that he and everyone else are never going to make it out. I love how for the next few months the contestants adapt for their hardships with Amelia full time teaching yoga to others, Subway Seat walking with his arms, and Adam showing off their presence by holding a blade of grass. Ari eventually comes back and eliminates Liam, with Liam being taken aback by the news as he's gotten used to living in the plane by this point and this built up bond he's built with everyone in it. But no matter. Liam is back home but 
Everything feels different, lifeless almost. He's presumed dead to the face of the earth, and is off to figure out the mysteries of Stone's post-it notes. He finds Bryce and Texty, learns about the history of one, meets Oscar, looks for the exact location to visit the waiting room, which has different looks depending on the viewpoint of the beholder, and the codes for the various dimensions the free need to hop on to find Aerie. That was, until Aerie suddenly brings Bryce back to the plane, leaving Liam all alone. Liam, at first, is pissed at Aerie, but forms a very quick bond with him, only to resent him after his death. Liam eventually loses access to the post-it notes, Texty, Aerie, his right leg once again, and pretty much the waiting room. He's stuck, and he's all alone, with nothing but Aerie's Pearl Jam cassette, the computer, which he should probably learn how to operate eventually considering his former San Francisco job, and the plane, with all of his friends and acquaintances trapped. Also, something that I just now noticed, during the entire time Aerie was present, there was always a sun looming over the contestants, but when he's killed, the sun is no longer present, and it's especially apparent in 118's final moments. I hear many people saying that they absolutely fucking hate this ending, saying a cliffhanger cop-out ending like that is absolute bullshit, but for me, it's perfect. While sure, it is cruel for a show as important from a storytelling standpoint as one to end off like this, but what if I told you that that was the whole point, poetically speaking and metaphorically speaking? Poetically, for Liam's goal to stop the show to be met ironically by taking Aerie's place and putting the entire show on limbo for everyone, a bit of an exactly what you run from you end up chasing sort of ordeal, and metaphorically for the common running joke that object show creators get burnt out, and take your long hiatuses on their object shows, oftentimes outright cancelling them with no resolution in sight. And to me, it wraps up all of the themes of dread, existentialism, and misery present throughout the show perfectly. Though there are admittedly some problems, like aspects of the story not being fleshed out enough, it's absolutely solid and I admittedly almost teared up at the countless times I've seen this ending. Can I get a tea? Howdy y'all, I'm Grandma Nuko, and I'm here to talk to y'all about AHFJ1 Season 2. Thanks for Chip for letting on and having patience to wait for me to be done. I'm sorry, Chip. But anyways, on to the show. Whoa, 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 what? HFJ1 Season 2, Episode 1, right up eight. The episode starts with Liam's fingies out, the whole beginning of the episode trying to hitchhack, ending up in different hostels, until he makes it to the city of Bridgeport, the address which led to our favorite soda bottle, as soon as Sid Battle sees Liam, he closes the door instantly. Now this is where most of the episode takes place, as Liam tries to convince Soda Bottle to open the door and let him in. He continues to get madder and madder until someone walks in on screaming, and he stops walking over the elevator, crying like a little baby. <laughs> After he heads back to the door, soon falling asleep, as ten hours pass, Soda Bottle finally says it to Liam, uh, asking, Is she still there? <laughs> what? And that's where the episode ends. I'm sorry, Chip, but this is so long. This took so long for me to record just for this two, 54, 55 second clip. Just cut this out. Cut this whole part. Of oh yeah, something I just now noticed while I was editing Grimm's part. If you sync up sometimes by Pearl Jam with Rattlepate, then you get this. Shout out to this video for helping me realize it. It's a great deal. You're going to love it. Another thing I noticed was that the book that Folder was reading to Whippy Creamy is an excerpt of The Shawshank Redemption, which is mostly a book about escapism and stuff like that, which is pretty eminent of Liam's departure from the show, if you if you can say that. So, yeah. Pretty cool, eh? Mr. Worldwide. So, in conclusion, the show and Radiohead should serve as a perfect reminder to anybody looking to create something in a specific genre that you do not have to follow the rules of said specific genre in order to make something absolutely deep, depressing, artistic, and thought-provoking. Within the hardships of classification with Cheesy HFJ's work on one, he's built up a huge cult following for his show and continues to support the immense success he's rightfully gained. I am overall very proud of the object show community as a whole for making such a huge leap in creative expression beyond the conformities of genre. Thanks, by the way. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Thanks, guys. I'm glad you're back, Backpack. Thanks, Senti. I'd be surprised if you didn't get the most votes. You definitely deserve to go home the most, out of all of us. Yeah, totally. Definitely. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Sorry for 
standing in front of your door all night, by the way. Thanks for participating. It was 50 bucks. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, by the way. For what? For convincing me to stick this through. By the way, I made you a bed. If you want to go to sleep, you can use that. The show itself is absolutely amazing and thought-provoking. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. The lore behind it goes absolutely hard. The traumatic moments hit absolutely deep. And this entire series is worth taking the two hours out of your day to watch. If you're looking for something depressing and existential with aspects of horror and mystery, and the added background info of the history of object shows, then one is the one for you. Alright, I understand the joke was bad, I'll be in my basement.